Thank you for joining again today on our Side by Side. Do you know, there are so many things happen in life, strange things that happen, surprising things, and you never know where they will ever lead to. One such event like that happened for Joan and I when someone called into the little New Beginnings shop and asked us if we would like to go and see some books. We visited this house on Mark Street, which was a story in itself, but it was lined wall to wall with books, with cassettes, and with recordings of performances of various uh, musical performances and various things like that. Well, what could we take? Well, we could have anything, really. (laughs) Well, there was so much stuff, we just selected a few books that we thought might be interesting. But among all the things that we found there, there was a little badge, and it was the badge of the League of Health and Beauty, which was quite interesting because we'd never heard of that, and it was an interesting little badge. We did a little bit of research, and we discovered that this was an organisation that was that was created or was was began by the mother of Prunella Stack. Uh, Prunella, Prunella's, Prunella's mother died when she was just 20, and she inherited this organisation. Her mother was a Mrs. Vargo Stack, and she, of course, she had a real passion for what we might call today like health and fitness. Back then, they organised this organisation grew to one hundred and sixty thousand, and they met in the various uh, groups all over Europe and and in North America. At its time in the thirties, it was one of these great, and in the forties, one of these really really big organisations. Prunella used to come to Portrush because her grandmother came there from time to time. She had a house there, and I I imagine that that was the house that Joan and I had been invited to go and see these many interesting things. But we finally came across a book that Prunella had written, and I want to read you a little bit today from this book, and, and just go with me in it, and you'll see where it's coming. Just sit back and enjoy the few minutes we have together. During my early childhood, I spent most summer and Easter holidays with my grandmother. She was living then at Portrush in the north of Ireland. Her house was built on a headland jutting out into the wild Atlantic, and days were filled with wind and intermittent sunshine. The wide stretches of yellow sand ended in cliffs of grey limestone, topped with close-cropped glass grass where sheep grazed. The pools resting in the rocks at the cliff's base were a happy hunting ground for children. My cousin and I would return at the end of the day, clasping jam jars containing anemones, starfish and other treasures of the deep, and carrying bedraggled bunches of sea pinks and harebells picked on the cliff's summit and from among the grey stones. I remember one incident very clearly. I must have been six or seven at the time. And I was sitting on the beach with Nellie, our nurse, surveying a complicated network of fortresses and moats which I had constructed to be filled with the incoming tide. Nellie was drowsing, and over above us were the seagulls weaving their pattern of flight against a blue sky. I was suddenly consciously aware of their swiftness and strength and grace, but suddenly all this was violently broken with the sound of a shot which rang out from the sand dunes above the beach followed by a wild flurry of gulls' wings and the raucous cries of alarm. The bird fell to the ground. At the same time, I saw a group of boys emerge from the sand dunes and one of them carrying a gun. You must not shoot the gulls, I repeated to them. To me, it was obvious that there was nothing more to say. Suddenly, my conviction disarmed the boys. They smiled and glanced at one another, half shamefaced, half half amused, and then they turned and ran away. Just a little bit of an insight from her early time in Portrush. Can you imagine it? Being down the beach and hearing a gunshot go off today and some gull landing at your feet? Well, enough of that. Prunella went on to get married. Her first husband was called David. He was a pilot in the Second World War. David was killed uh, in his plane crashed. He and his navigator were were killed. And she was given the news of that as she was waiting to meet him, literally, at the airport or at the aerodrome, as they would have called it back then. This is what she said concerning that. She said, I was searching for answers to my desolation. 
After my mother's death, I'd been upheld by the Christian creed of immortality. Her faith had sustained me, and I had known a warming presence which brought comfort and the certainty of life after death. But I could no longer believe this, or believe in communication between the living and the dead. The war had sapped my faith. It had confronted me with stark facts which seemed inexplicable in Christian terms. I could no longer delude myself with the idea of a loving, personal God, or imprint nature with my subjective needs. It seems sad, and she continues in her life for some time until she meets and marries another man whom she had met some years prior to this in Oxford, who was studying to be a doctor. They married, and she and her two sons from her previous marriage went to South, to South Africa. Let me read you and pick up there at that time. They're now one year in South Africa. She's just married maybe about a year, a little more. I need a moment just to get myself to the right place. Pardon me. Good that you've got patience to sit with me. <sighs> On Good Friday, Ali, that's her second husband, suggested that we should go to the three-hour service of vigil which commemorated the crucifixion. Neither of us had been to this before, nor were we committed Christians. His scientific training had made him sceptical of religious belief, while I lost my earlier unquestioning faith during the war, and it was only slowly returning. We came to the service with open minds, as onlookers rather than as participants, and we chose a small church in one of the suburbs where the Bishop of Cape Town was giving the address. The church was full, row upon row of people knelt in silence in an atmosphere of reverence and prayer. At the end of that service, as they took the people through the story, as it were, of that last two days of Christ, the crucifixion, course the highlight there with his final words it is finished she then says stumbling out into the easter sunshine i could see that ali and i felt the same we were both too moved to speak we walked slowly to the car and drove home in silence and looking back over the years i can recognize turning points this good friday service was a turning point for me a door had been opened which before was closed and one day i might venture through it the next day was Easter Saturday, and he and I, my husband and I, were to walk uh, through the track of the foot of Table Mountain and climbing up, and that was what was the plan for the day. And she says, we proceeded in single file, Ali first followed by Tom and then myself. And at one particular part on that, her husband, trying to stretch from one rock to another rock, lost his footing and fell 90 feet to his death. There was nothing could be done for him, so quick, so suddenly, and so painfully. I hope you don't mind if our little recording goes a little today after the 10 minutes, but I want to take you through this last little section. The day after Ali's death was Easter Sunday. I lay on my bed, gazing across the garden at our view of Table Mountain. I felt myself lifted into a sphere of being which I had never known before. It seemed as though all earthly material things had ceased to matter, even to exist, as though nothing existed but an extra extraordinary lightness of spirit, an intense recognition of the unity at the heart of things. In this sphere, there was no division between life and death. I felt very close to Ali and was filled with a confidence and peace. Paradoxically, with the greatest loss that I could have sustained came also the greatest gift. It was as though God had taken everything from me, left my heart an empty void, and then filled it with himself. I can only say that for me it was completely valid. It made me a committed Christian, something which I have remained ever since. And though with time the vision faded, the faith which inspired it never altered and has continued as the basis of my life.
This sense of supernatural comfort lifted me out of the terrible ordeal of my husband's death. Now soon the heavy load of grief returned and increased by the effects of the tragedy on those nearest to me. I was still living in the inner world of the spirit, which seemed to me far more real than the world of everyday life. I read William Temple's readings from St. John's Gospel and St. Augustine's Confessions, and for the first time I understood the response of the disciple when he realized that Jesus was the Christ. Depart from me, O Lord, for I am a sinful man. I long to be cleansed, to make a new start, and to throw off the burden of past wrongdoing. Many people in deep distress have felt the same. It is for them that confession and communion, the sacraments of the Church, exist. Once belief is absolute, once one has taken the step through the door, these sacraments become living realities. But the step cannot be taken by the will alone. The will can only bring us to the threshold. But love is the only agent which can take one through. The loving of God, or the love of God reaching out to the soul in the depths of its suffering. I just end there because I couldn't help thinking about this lady's story as we were having communion yesterday and the power of God to speak to us through those things that he has given us as gifts to help us remember. And so it's just a little story. It has poor dredge connections, but it's also got connections to grief and to the gospel and to your heart and to my heart. And I hope it's been an encouragement for you today. And I look forward to sharing then with you tomorrow as we continue side by side through the Beatitudes.